All right, I think we'll get started as it's 12.15. I would like to welcome everybody here to this seminar in this Law and Humanities seminar series at the Peking University School of Transnational Law, Beijing Dazhe Guoji Fa Shui Yuan. My name is Norman Ho, and again, a warm welcome to everybody here in the classroom. And I'd also like to acknowledge and extend a warm welcome to friends of ours who are joining on Zoom. We're very privileged today to have as our speaker, Professor Ryan Mitchell. Uh, professor Mitchell is an associate professor at the Faculty of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And his research interests primarily are at the intersections of Chinese law, international law, legal history, comparative public law, as well as political and legal theory. Uh, his publications include, and everyone can see here on the slide, his recent monograph, uh, Recentering the World, China and the Transformation of International Law, uh, as well as journal articles in various leading legal journals in the United States. And Professor Mitchell today will present a talk based on his monograph here, Recentering the World, China and the Transformation Transformation, excuse me, of international law, which was recently published by the Cambridge University Press. Professor Mitchell will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, after which we will open the floor to questions and answers and discussion. I would like to give the floor now to Professor Mitchell. Thank you. Great, so thank you so much uh, to Norman for the wonderful introduction and to all of you uh, in attendance, uh, in person and via Zoom. Um, I'm really thrilled to be able to have a chance to share uh, this new publication with everyone and to talk a little bit about some of the topics that were covered in the book as well as uh, a few of the motivations that lay behind writing it and uh, a bit as well about some of the kind of ongoing scholarly projects and conversations to which uh, I'm trying to make a contribution with this particular work. So ultimately, uh, this was a book that is more or less focused on trying to marry two different areas of scholarship, one of which is on Chinese legal history, and the other of which is on the history of international law. And those are two deeply entwined subjects, but of course, uh, in most of the existing scholarship that's out there, um, they are often not really quite uh, closely connected with each other or only interface with each other indirectly. So my goal with this particular project was to try and take both of those fields and to really attempt something closer to a pure 50-50 distribution of attention to looking at both uh, Chinese legal history and the history of the international legal system and to really uh, look in more detail and with a larger degree of focus on the areas in which the two fields have really been intertwined historically and have affected each other. So, for example, one of the aspects that I was really concerned with attempting to figure out in greater detail was to what extent was China as a state and Chinese lawyers and diplomats uh, and government officials to what extent were they active as not just recipients, but also as makers or contributors to uh, international law and to the norms that have since become considered part of the international legal system as uh, uh, in a general global sense, right? Not in a sense specifically related to China. So this is obviously a question that can go in a few different ways. Um, it's a big question, uh, even though it's just a sub-question of the larger project, which is about the overall connections between Chinese legal history, modern Chinese legal history, and the history uh, of the international legal system. 
But uh, even just that one specific sub-question about the contributions of Chinese officials, diplomats, and lawyers to general international law was already something that is arguably a little bit too big to handle in a single project. Um, and so uh, it's, uh, it's not something that I was set out to give a comprehensive account of in this book, but it, it was something that I was looking at uh, in pretty extensive detail throughout all of the archival research that I did uh, going into the writing of the monograph. And I'll talk in a little bit more detail about that specific question, about the contributions made by Chinese uh, officials, diplomats, and lawyers, uh, and others, to general international law uh, at the global level. And then I'll also be talking about some of the other aspects of the project that I think um, have managed to make contributions to a few different conversations. Um, so, you know, as I've, I think, been suggesting, the goal uh, for this monograph was not really to provide the final word or a very comprehensive encyclopedic account of any of the areas that it looks at, but it was to engage with a few different related sets of issues and to try and make contributions to each of those uh, different conversations. So along those lines, um, I want to point out that uh, the book is informed, heavily informed by some of the existing studies that are out there. Um, many of which uh, were really, you know, extremely useful, indispensable studies. Um, so that includes classic works by historian uh, Emmanuel Xu, uh, Stephen Platt, with more recent work on the Opium Wars, uh, which has been really extremely helpful. Uh, Tang Qihua uh, has a very wonderful and useful work on the Hague Conferences and Chinese participation, which was an indispensable reference. Um, recent work by Stephen Halsey, uh, about the Qing dynasties, the late Qing period's attempts to increase state power and to be engaged in uh, international geopolitical competition. Uh, although his focus uh, in his recent work on that subject was not law specifically, there was a very heavy legal component to the discussions of international relations uh, activities and conduct. Activity. Uh, the historian Rune Svarverud's work on the reception of international legal concepts is also something that I would point out as being especially useful. Um, so uh, I, and there's, you know, the list could go on and on. There's really quite a lot of uh, excellent work done on closely related subjects to the uh, historical account that I give in the book. Um, and I found myself, you know, turning to this existing work um, and not seeing this project as being one to try and overturn existing understandings in some kind of radical way. As I mentioned, I think a lot of these existing, converse, uh, existing scholarship is quite good and thorough. Um, however, uh, the project differs from what's already out there in that it uh, does focus more specifically on China as part of the international legal order taken as a whole and on Chinese contributions to and engagements with the making of international legal norms um, in comparison with, for example, the focus on China's geopolitical situation during the time of the Hague Conferences or the time of the Versailles Peace Conference, uh, where there would be a legal component alongside you know, a, a larger focus on politics uh, and international uh, relations and, and such, uh, you know, adjacent fields. So, uh, and that was also the true uh, with the discussion of legal concepts in China, um, which I'll, I'll be getting to, and which ended up being one of the main focuses of the book as well, the sort of changing meanings over time of some of these key terms, uh, such as those related to sovereignty, international obligation, treaty law, et cetera. Um, so the book was sort of trying to trace at the same time China's contributions to the international legal order and engagements with it, as well as changing discussions of international law concepts and topics within China over, uh, over a relatively long period of time of about 150 years. So that sort of frames uh, the basic purposes of the book. And uh, in terms of the new conclusions that I think I managed to reach, some of which you know, are just somewhat uh, slightly revised accounts of what's already out there. Uh, 
Um, I would say that those fall into the four categories of one relating to China's role as an object of liberal legal projects, or in other words, China as an object of legal regulation via the means of international law. So I've tried to provide an account of how that phenomenon unfolded over the time between more or less the Second Opium War and uh, China's w, uh, entry into the WTO in 2001. Um, I also um, tried to provide new, a, a new account regarding the importation of international law concepts, uh, including especially a focus on sovereignty, which has been something that's been in scholarly conversation in recent years as what is the nature of sovereignty discourse in China? How did it start? Um, well, how has it changed over time? Where is it going? Uh, and, uh, and, and in addition to those two, uh, I discuss the activities, as I mentioned, of Chinese officials in international law settings and the concrete impacts on international law. And just noting here that the promotion of codification of international law, I argue, uh, has been one of China's biggest contributions and most uh, lasting effects of the Chinese engagement with the field of international law has been promotion of the idea of codification, uh, that international law should not just consist in customary principles that are understood among members of a community of nations, but rather that there should be a, a code of international law that is just as specific and detailed and on paper as uh, any domestic legal code. So that is not an idea that originates with Chinese officials or lawyers, but it is something that became very important in the context of China's engagement with international law. And ultimately, I argue in the book, became really a Chinese project over the course of the early to mid 20th century, the idea of codification as opposed to relying on vague informal standards that can be easily manipulated and abused by powerful states became something that Chinese, um, Chinese contributors to international law discourse heavily focused on and often in ways that actually had a real effect. So um, in terms of the con uh, way that the research was conducted, um, as, as I mentioned in the kind of pre-title to um, today's talk, uh, the main research that went into uh, the writing of the book was working with diplomatic archives. And more or less, uh, when you're looking through diplomatic sources, uh, there's, you know, obviously there's a close connection with international law as a uh, subject that you might be researching. But um, I would argue that in the Chinese case, the diplomatic archival resources for Chinese international law history are actually even more important than they are for almost any other state that you could uh, be researching uh, in terms of its role in international law. And this is, has a lot to do with the kind of very special modes of governance of China during the period between the mid 19th uh, through mid 20th centuries where lots of aspects of China's domestic governance were regulated via international treaties, uh, as many of us, I think, are aware, right? So the treaties themselves were hammered out over the course of conferences. They were subject to quite a lot of discussion in terms of projects for revision or abolition of the treaties, such as the, obviously, the Treaty of Nanjing, of 1842 is kind of, you know, that's the origin point for this whole practice of governance of China by multilateral treaties. Um, so actually, I argue that especially significant were these multilateral uh, treaties that had very wide membership. So uh, after the treaty, the Convention of Beijing after the end of the Second Opium War involving the leading Western states that were involved in China at the time, uh, the UK, France, Russia, and the United States, all becoming members, uh, party to these legal agreements, along with the Qing state, that basically turns this treaty into something that's actually a lot, it's, it's almost not really appropriate to call it just a treaty. It becomes closer to something that is constitutional in nature, right? And so this is the point that I try to make in the book.
that really we should be thinking of these multilateral treaty arrangements that put huge amounts of constraints on the Chinese government at different periods as being basically international arrangements of global constitutionalism that were you know, imposed at different periods of time. So in that sense, the domestic governance of China was so closely tied with international law that looking through the diplomatic archives where the agreements were being hammered out and discussed and in some cases protested um, really, I think, uh, becomes a very necessary resource for that historical project uh, and, and those historical accounts. So it, it's also relevant to look through the diplomatic archives in the Chinese case uh, when talking about legal topics because many of the leading lawyers uh, of China during these periods of time were diplomats and the people who had the skills in foreign law, uh, who had the skills to contribute to, to, to legal projects in international law, obviously, most of all, uh, were also the people who were being kind of pulled into the network of diplomatic officials and were being called upon to represent China in these conferences. Um, so for some domestic law topics, this was not necessarily the case, but for international law, it definitely was. And for some uh, aspects of domestic law during specific periods as well. So in particular, during the interwar period, um, many of the, of the leading uh, legal officials, including uh, people who were writing up new statutes for the domestic legal system, were also involved in diplomacy. Um, and of course, uh, in the Chinese case, a lot of the kind of most important projects of the state, such as abolishing extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, for foreign states, were really high top level concerns for the highest levels of government. And so you had the highest uh, level officials in the government, the sitting heads of state, et cetera, getting involved in these diplomatic episodes, sometimes directly and sometimes just indirectly but by sending orders and memos to their diplomats and lawyers and saying, for example, you must interpret a specific legal norm in a specific way. So certainly if you're researching these aspects of China's legal history, I think the diplomatic sources are, uh, are really very, very valuable. So um, I just want to list here, so this is just from the, the uh, front pages of the book, a list of archives consulted. and. Um, in terms of the Chinese diplomatic archives before the fall of the Qing Dynasty, a lot of these are compiled into different forms. So you have databases where they're made available. Um, a lot of them have been printed in these very you know, humongous volumes of, uh, of memos that are actually very hard to, to get through in terms of the layout. Like the dates are not easy to work with. Um, but, uh, but you know, the material is all out there and it's actually pretty easily accessible for the Qing Dynasty and the Republican uh, era. Um, in terms of the Republic period, there's really very, very helpful uh, archives available uh, on Taiwan. Uh, and some of those have now been made accessible remotely. Uh, so you can actually, you don't have to visit, you can just get access to a lot of these really useful resources uh, such as the uh, Guo Shi Guan uh, and a couple of others, which are available through Academia Sinica. And those, those can be accessed pretty conveniently and easily at this point. Um, so in terms of other resources, though, uh, and especially for a few of these periods of time, uh, I think one set of uh, resources that has perhaps been undervalued is uh, Japanese foreign ministry archives. So there's actually, they're not quite as full of information as, um, as, as on Chinese related topics as you might hope for, but there are, the stuff that is in there is actually pretty valuable because you get very clear statements about foreign policy goals and concerns and the, I found the, the Japanese archives very helpful in particular because you're getting things from a perspective that is neither that of the Chinese government, which had very specific goals, even you know, across different regimes. So from the Qing, from the late Qing through the Beiyang Zhengfu, through the Republican era and into the uh, early PRC, there's actually very consistent goals in terms of 
many aspects of policy on international law and treaty abolition, although different, a lot of differences in methods. Um, and in the Western sources, actually, you also get very consistent uh, viewpoints expressed over time. Um, the Japanese archives were useful, I think, because you are getting uh, very, uh, again, the, the actual archival material that's present in them that's relevant was a bit less, but there were actually some very interesting conversations in there. Uh, not, not really during the war period, um, because there everything is just about military strategy, but earlier on where the whole point of uh, the Japanese and the Western states in terms of their diplomatic materials is really about their competition for influence and what sort of strategies they're trying to adopt in terms of negotiating with various Chinese regimes. So uh, it, that sort of material, obviously, you know, when you, when you look at it, you can read it through a purely geopolitical lens where it's all about international relations and competing for uh, power and uh, all of those sorts of topics, which are very interesting. But in terms of the, the law and the development of the international legal norms, uh, there's actually quite a lot of implications there as well. For instance, with regards to things such as willingness to abandon extraterritorial rights or the interpretation of rules relating to things such as uh, state autonomy or ability to set tariff policy, these other sorts of norms that in the Chinese case were really very um, unique in many ways. And what we you know, ultimately see is that um, you know, in terms of the Western role in bringing international law to China, um, there was this very consistent, I would argue, uh, process over the course of really almost the entire period covered in the book, um, although there is a major turning point, obviously, in 1945. But, um, up to that point, really, you see a very consistent process in which law is used uh, very instrumentally as a way to uh, put the Chinese state in a very unique position of being administered via these multilateral legal rules. Uh, and again, something that is really, uh, I argue, should be seen in the context of global constitutionalism without adding that additional kind of implication that people usually have when they discuss global constitutionalism, which is that this is inherently a positive phenomenon. The global constitutionalism must be good because it's global and it's constitutionalism, and those are both good things, right? So global constitutionalism, constitutionalism must also be good. But actually, uh, I think if you, you have constitutions that are imposed by a group of the world's leading states on a particular state um, and that put it in a position of legal subordination. Uh, that is still global constitutionalism. Technically speaking, it's the imposition of a constitution via a global legal process. But it is not necessarily something that um, you know, we should look back on fondly. Uh, and indeed, you know, it's, uh, I think most of the story of the book is a story of the imposition of these sorts of norms and how they led to the counter projects to try and, uh, try and remove or transform the legal rules that China was forced to operate under. So um, just to switch gears a little bit um, to make things more concrete. So in terms of this process of objectification, I found myself focusing quite a bit on some particular individuals who um, actually are sort of often not always given the spotlight that I think they deserve in some of these historical accounts that exist so far. So one example is the Prussian uh, missionary slash translator Carl Gutzlaff, who played a very important role in the early history of Hong Kong. Um, so Gutzlaff was this very interesting figure who was um, you know, a religious uh, Lutheran missionary, although he later distanced himself from the official Lutheran church. Um, he ended up coming to um, Hong Kong and having this project of trying to engage in uh, extensive uh, spreading of Christian missionary material, but also legal material and political material, trying to spread Western ideas of law and politics along with Western religion, and sort of seeing the two as being inherently bound up together, as a lot of people did during the mid-19th century. Um, but in his case, really um, being one of the most active of, of these individuals, 
and also getting involved in the diplomatic side as a translator and then even eventually as an administrator in Hong Kong. Um, so uh, during the negotiations to uh, end the first Opium War, uh, Gutzloff was really the lead translator that was involved, and he was also advising British officials on policy. Um, and I take note of Gutzloff in part um, for, well, a few different reasons, one of which is that he was the first person to introduce concepts such as sovereignty into the Chinese language, something that has actually, I think, been not really adequately addressed in some of the work on the early origins of sovereignty uh, in China. Um, so Gutzloff tried to do it via this concept that he referred to uh, as zi zhu zhi quan, uh, or the authority or power of self-rule. And this was his translation of sovereignty. And uh, this becomes something that is a term that's continually used, uh, although it eventually ends up getting replaced by zhu quan, which is the more common version that's used today. Um, and, but I'll have a little bit more to say about the origins of sovereignty as well, but it, I think it is relevant to know that it starts with Gutzloff and it starts during the period of the negotiations to end the First Opium War. Um, another of the figures that I point to is uh, W.A.P. W. Martin, who is uh, known as, um, as uh, one of the, as the first person to translate an international law text into Chinese, the Wang Guo Gongfa in 1864. Uh, and who was usually credited with introducing a lot of these international law terms and ideas uh, into the Chinese language. And uh, he, did, he was working with some uh, official translators that were appointed by the Qing court, however, uh, which is something that I try to point out in the book. Um, and um, he, was, uh, he was also somebody that I, you know, I argue was really quite... Um, Maybe our historical impressions about W.A.P. Martin are not necessarily you know, entirely reflective of his, his actual life and positions in some ways. So he tends to get remembered as this kind of apolitical educator, but really throughout his life he expressed a lot of views about uh, the kind of international legal system that he thought China should be a part of, that it was, for instance, proper to, for the first opium war to be waged by Britain, because of China's refusal to engage in terms of equal diplomacy with Western states. Uh, he had very weird views, such as uh, these about the Mexican-American War, that uh, it was not the waters of the Rio Grande that divided Texas and, from Mexico, but the impossibility of Anglo-American Protestants being one with Spanish Catholics. Um, and uh, similar ideas about sort of culture and civilization being the key towards the you know, legal identity uh, and modernity of a, of a particular state. So he was a very heavy advocate in China of intervention in support of the Taiping uh, re uh, rebel movement um, and really wanted uh, you know, Western states to come in and split China up into two, uh, into two states because he thought that the Han Chinese Taiping movement would be more modern and progressive and a better fit to kind of join the global community than the Manchu Qing dynasty. And so he had you know, various projects like this throughout his life, um, which tend to get kind of glossed over, but I really tried to put some uh, emphasis uh, or just to bring them a little bit more into the spotlight in the book, because I think it is quite relevant to understand um, in terms of this narrative of international law ideas and practices coming to China, it was not just a neutral process of spreading knowledge, it was a process that was being led by specific individuals with specific ideas, many of which were ideas that today, not just in China, but really, you know, probably more globally, we would think are a little bit kind of uh, imperialist and uh, quite, um, quite out of line with, you know, more tolerant and cosmopolitan ideas that we tend to share uh, in current times. So, um, yeah, I mean, the book is obviously, it's not intended as a hit piece on Martin. It's not about trying to, you know, take down his reputation. But I just found that to be one of the things that came out of this account uh, is to look at some of these individual figures that, uh, you know, have been, were interfaces in this process and to really think about what they were, what were, what were their actual motivations at various periods of time. And does that influence how we should interpret some of these processes?
that were part of this intellectual history, such as the translation of the Wang Guo Gongfa book. Um, so uh, that kind of leads into this topic of intellectual reception. So works like Wang Guo Gongfa, which was the first international law textbook that was translated into Chinese, uh, and was not really fully embraced by the Qing state uh, at first, but then when it proved useful to know some of these international legal rules, such as those on neutrality and territorial administration, uh, eventually the state did order that the book should be printed and distributed to all of its uh, diplomats uh, it, it, and those dealing with uh, foreign diplomats in different uh, urban centers throughout China. So they printed up a few hundred copies. But many of the concepts that were referred to therein, including those relating to sovereignty, were not actually widely adopted even after the uh, publication of the Wang Guo Gongfa, and even after the state did in somewhat endorse it by ordering the copies be stored with some of its officials. Um, and so that's where I really actually emphasize the aspect of the Japanese influence during the late 19th century in particular, which uh, is not often discussed um, quite as much as the Western role during the same years. But I argue that in terms of the intellectual reception, we actually should really think about the reception of a lot of these ideas of international law and modern um, or Western style statehood uh, as coming via the medium of Japanese influence and publications. So, this is, uh, is something that I argue was true of the concept of sovereignty in particular. Um, so uh, on the one hand, I think it's important for us to re actually recognize when you go through the old sources from the middle uh, 19th century years that actually before the Second Opium War, during the period when uh, the Chinese Xianfeng Emperor was still really grappling with foreign influence, um, some of those internal conversations at this period of time actually were already seeming to reflect some of the Western legal concepts and Western ideas of international relations. So terms such as yu guo or di guo, di guo being used not in the sense of enemy state but just of equal or rival state, but not necessarily an actual you know, enemy in war. Uh, but both of these sorts of terms were actually being used in some of the uh, internal imperial uh, mon uh, memoranda and communications and orders before the Second Opium War. So during the period of time when these were just internal conversations among officials where the Chinese emperor and the officials were talking about what is the status of these other states, they would use these terms that were, that were not this you know, idea of the pure, of the universal rule of the Chinese emperor, the idea uh, which is usually what we see in many of the conversations that exist in, um, in discussions of uh, China's process of adopting the concept of sovereignty. We often see sovereignty contrasted with this tianxia idea. And of course, it's true that there was this idea of the emperor is the ruler over tianxia. But what was tianxia, right? Is tianxia actually literally the entire world? Um, so I think in practice, at least by the middle years of the 1800s and before the Second Opium War, you already had the Chinese emperor and the Chinese uh, leading ministers basically very practically recognizing that tianxia, you know, this is, this is not the spatial concept to work with. China, uh, or the Qing dynasty, the Qing state, is a state with a specific territory. It's a big territory, and it's kind of fuzzy at the borders. And there might be some questions about which, you know, whether this or that territory belongs or does not. However, it was not just a very general idea of universal political rule or universal legal authority, in contrast with the Western notion of exact state, nation state borders and, and legal uh, jurisdiction. So there was this whole in-between layer of conversations where there were some ideas that were more uh, on the traditional side and some ideas that were reflecting real concrete things that were going on uh, at present in terms of these international relations. So on the one hand, uh, on the Chinese side, even during the, you know, maybe even uh, you know, early part of the late Qing period, uh, 
uh, there was an adoption of these uh, Western international law and uh, dom even domestic public law concepts. And a lot of these were being uh, developed through the lens of this term guoti, which was what was invoked prior to the rise of zhuquan or sovereignty as being the kind of term through that was sort of the main keyword of Chinese foreign policy, which it remains today in many ways. The term that was used was guoti, which could refer to a couple of different concepts that were linked in very interesting ways. But on the one hand, it can mean the prestige or reputation or dignity of the state, uh, like ti mian, right? This, the dignity or face, even, uh, of the state. And on the other hand, it could be the guo ti of ti zhi, guo jia de ti zhi. Uh, so you could have the structure of the state, or you could have the dignity of the state. And actually, they were looked at as being almost interlinked concepts. Um, and the term itself had this later history of uses that I talk about briefly in the book, um, and I talk about in a little more detail in, uh, in another article. Um, but it's, it's still used today in constitutional law context, for example, uh, zheng ti versus guo ti, right? Uh, if you've studied Chinese constitutional law textbooks, you have probably run into that particular concept. Um, but so in any case, the guo ti concept um, was used before zhu quan, before sovereignty, to refer to a lot of very similar issues regarding the, the identity of the state, its powers, and uh, which rights and which authorities it would be acceptable or legitimate to give up in a treaty to a foreign state, or in the case of many of these occasions, to a group of foreign states. So for example, authority over tariffs, right? Should a state have the right to set its own tariffs? Well, it's ideal if it has that right, but actually, uh, if you have to make a choice, in the mid-Qing period, there was um, uh, a, a debate about this in the context of the, uh, uh, one of the instances that I talk about, the Shanghai Tariff Conference of 1858, the emperor, Xianfeng, was actually very much willing to give up the power of, uh, of setting tariffs for China. He thought it was more important to maintain the dignity of the imperial office. So Guo Ti was really about the status of the emperor and of the imperial capital. Whereas you had officials pushing back and saying, no, more important, or they wouldn't say more, but say they would say equally important to the status of the emperor for Guo Ti is the ability to set your own tariffs or the ability to block access to uh, the Yellow River or to the Yangtze and not to allow foreign ships to permeate these strategic zones. Um, so this, uh, basically these are conversations about what we would think of as sovereignty, but they were being put through the lens of a different concept. So it's a little too simplistic to just say, first there was no concept of sovereignty and then this concept of sovereignty was imported Really, it's much more of a process of different ideas being used to, to describe and to make arguments about different aspects of what today we think of as being state sovereignty. Um, so in terms of the, the term Zhu Quan itself or sovereignty, uh, one thing that I try to point out uh, in the book, which is usually reflected in conversations in Chinese scholarship, but not so much in English language scholarship, is that the term Zhu Quan actually already existed in Chinese for a long time, um, and it was something that was present uh, as far back as the as Guanzi, uh, where he talks about how if the ruler, if the treasury is depleted, the ruler's authority will wane. Um, and but it was used in many other contexts as well. It was not. It was never a very popular and widely used term as it became later on. It is today. But it was used to refer to the authority of the emperor in a lot of different contexts, um, such as a, a, a corrupt minister would cuan zhu quan, like he would take the authority of the emperor. Uh, and so it was a term that was in use. Uh, so it then becomes repurposed for use in China uh, to refer to this set of ideas and practices that are encompassed by the Western term sovereignty. And I argue that the way that that happened was via these um, Japanese sources, uh, primarily. So there is, there is usage in W. P. Martin's uh, 1864 book, Wang Guo Gongfa. But actually, the important uh, instances that we see with regards to the transmission of the concept of sovereignty uh, 
um, I argue that on the one hand, there are these Japanese publications on international law where actually there's a lot of emphasis on sovereignty um, starting in the 1870s. Um, and then there is this uh, specific instance of the dispute over the status of uh, Liuqiu or Ryukyu uh, and Taiwan in, uh, in the early 1870s, uh, which is really one of the first major diplomatic slash foreign policy crises that the Qing dynasty faces during this uh, period after the Second Opium War. And this is totally about Japan and its status as whether it is an independent state, whether uh, what, what is the status of China, about different uh, geopolitical agendas. And those are being played out in terms of the status of Taiwan in particular. So the Japanese side uh, basically is trying to argue against Chinese uh, territorial control over Taiwan. And they use this uh, memorandum, which is full of very brief references to Western international law authorities, but in including Vattel um, and uh, uh, Blunchli, the German uh, international lawyer who was very influential at that time, and uh, uh, Grotius and a couple of others. And it's really this memorandum, I would argue, that is the one document that we should give the credit for launching a lot of the subsequent shift in the Chinese uh, appropriations and uh, interpretations of international law. And it's really, it's all about territorial control. So actually, the, it, although it's a very brief document, um, the emphasis on territorial sovereignty becomes something that pretty clearly, very swiftly leads to a shift in the conversations internal to the Chinese side in terms of ministers, and what they're saying, what diplomats are saying, and the adoption of the concept of Zhuquan for landed territorial sovereignty over specific territories that can be shown on a map with specific lines drawn goes from something that was just part of the conversation to becoming really the dominant focus um, after this confrontation with Japan uh, in, the, in 1874. So I would say it's really not so much, uh, in terms of the, the reception of ideas of territory, it's really not so much these translations from the Western missionaries that we should be thinking about, although those are very relevant to the overall story, but really it's the confrontation with Japan specifically, uh, although with other states at this, uh, around the same years, but especially uh, over Taiwan in, uh, in 1874. So in terms of the uh, engagement of Chinese officials and diplomats with international law, and uh, especially with the making of new rules, this actually becomes more the theme of the middle part of the book and then into the, the, the latter half of the book, uh, which is um, something that I looked at in terms of the diplomatic records that deal with specific conferences. So I put a uh, relatively large degree of emphasis on the Hague conferences. Uh, and this was in part because these were the first international law making meetings at which Chinese officials participated directly uh, at the international level. And um, I found that these were really relevant and worth studying, um, despite the fact that the Chinese proposals themselves at these particular conferences were not especially successful. Um, but I found that the process of uh, engaging and making suggestions and having those suggestions fail, actually, was one that uh, was really quite revealing. So uh, the 1907 Hague Conference in particular, Chinese delegates, the late Qing delegates show up and they actually have, by this point, the delegates have international law training, at least uh, several of them do. And they have a very clear idea of which particular international law rules are disfavorable for China. So those include, for example, rules on the use of force very loose, vague, 19th century Western rules that permit uh, military interventions basically as a matter of arbitrary discretion. So if a state feels that its interests have been harmed, it can use different means to take a, a reprisal against the state that's accused of that. And one of those was military intervention. And the rules about when that turns into an actual war were very, very unclear. And Chinese diplomats, Qing diplomats, uh, in 1907 were already pointing that out in a pretty clear and direct and trying to be systematic way. Um, and they had absolutely no chance of changing the rules on that uh, at that time. 
among the great powers. Uh, however, that goal, that project of trying to change the legal norms, uh, specifically around the use of force, then becomes something that is really a consistent project for Qing officials over the next several decades. And so I think, uh, and I argue in the book, you should really see this as being a consistent project that starts around you know, the, these years of the very beginning of the 1900s and that actually kind of has its culmination later on uh, at places like the San Francisco Conference uh, that founded the United Nations where individuals such as Wang Chonghui, who was China's first international judge at the Permanent Court of International Justice, uh, and uh, was uh, one of uh, Sun Zhongshan's uh, early co-founders of, uh, of his revolutionary movement, um, that he, people such as Wang Chonghui were actually, um, really actually did play quite an important and effective influential role in getting some of these rules changed. So at the San Francisco conference in 1945, uh, Wang was the main judicial representative for China uh, for the Republic of China at this conference. And over the past several decades from you know, 1907, which he attended uh, when he was still a student, through 1945 when he attended as the lead delegate uh, for the judicial conferences at the founding of the UN, Wang was insisting on these ideas about the use of force needing to be defined and restricted and uh, international peaceful settlement of international disputes needing to be more firmly established as a default rule in, in international law, not something that was just based on the arbitrary decision of the state. And these sorts of projects were things that um, he actually contributed quite a bit to in the course of these committee meetings. Uh, in, the, in terms of the San Francisco conference, I demonstrate through looking at some of the records uh, for the conference that it was very ironically um, the US representative actually uh, at the judicial conference that ends up specifically striking down Wang's, uh, or not striking down, but by not giving his support ends up being the deciding vote in terms of not adopting the rule for mandatory ICJ jurisdiction over essentially all international disputes. So now if it hadn't been for this particular decision by this particular uh, US judge would would that have become the rule? I think maybe not because the Soviets also did not want that necessarily. Could the Chinese delegates have convinced the Soviets along with the Latin Americans uh, who supported this idea? It's, I don't get into all of the speculative alternative you know, possible ways that it could have gone, but um, I do try to show that you know, the Chinese representatives such as Wang in particular were very much central to these conversations and what they were pushing for was uh, almost always a greater degree of clarity and definition and binding character towards international legal norms. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of uh, lasting impact, one of the other themes of the book uh, is to try and point out some of these uh, obscure voices. So not just um, individuals such as Wang Chonghui who uh, were really kind of among the more prominent um, people in the legal and diplomatic worlds but also some in-between figures. So one person that I, I try to draw attention to uh, is Liang Yunli, who ended up working uh, for the UN Secretariat, so not as a Chinese diplomat, but actually as a Secretariat official uh, at the UN, but who was really did a lot of work to promote codification and has been more or less forgotten uh, both in China and the West because he was in this in-between role, right? He was kind of working for the organization. He was not He's not like you know working on behalf of the state per se, but he's also not working. Um, uh, he's also not working in a role that was directly on behalf of any foreign state. So because histories and often end up being nationalist histories, people who are important but who are kind of working in international organizations or in between uh, different sorts of uh, state positions can often get sort of forgotten. Um, there's also some interesting and some more, um, you know, perhaps less admirable individuals that are included. So one, one of the lawyers that I talk about is Zhou Wei, who was the first Chinese member of the international, the important international law organization Institut de Droit International, uh, which is one of the real founding early international law organizations. Its first Chinese member uh, was a, a lawyer diplomat named Zhou Wei. And he uh, ended up being a collaborator with Japan. Uh, and for that reason is really not 
not research very much these days. But uh, before that, he actually was part a participant in a lot of quite important processes, um, including some of Chinese engagement at the, at the League of Nations, um, as well as writing the first uh, important international law treatise by a Chinese author that was influential at the global level. So this was uh, during the period right before the end of the First World War, where he wrote uh, basically an outline of a possible League of Nations just before the founding of the actual League of Nations. And he wasn't, you know, other people had talked about the idea of a League of Nations, but he really wrote a very detailed project for this. And so these are the kinds of people who have fallen out of the conversation um, that I tried to include in the book because they certainly, you know, they're part of the history. Um, and so it would be, uh, you know, I think it's important to understand some of their contributions and then also some of the things that they did um, that were not really, uh, you know, great uh, contributions, so, to put it mildly, right? So, but I think that's, uh, that's part of the message of the book. So this is also the case with regards to some of these, you know, Western figures such as the missionaries um, who, as I mentioned, often get described, if anybody bothers to write about them at all, it's usually because they want to write something very enthusiastic about W.A.P. W. Martin or the others. But you know, I think we need to look at the, the nice and the ugly sides uh, of, of each of these figures, um, as well as, as, as at the more global context. So um, the very last chapter of the book is really more of an epilogue. Um, it, it's really, uh, as, as you might notice, if you do read through the book, it kind of concludes. We get to 1945, and then uh, the rest of what's to come uh, it cannot really be dealt with at the same level of detail. So what, it, what we get instead is more of a kind of meditation on some of the lasting impacts and transformations of these projects that Chinese diplomats and officials had pursued earlier on, such as rules for the use of force or uh, rights against, extra, uh, against extraterritorial jurisdiction, rights of tariff sovereignty and economic self-determination and these other sorts of rules. Um, and so I try to look at this in the last chapter and in the, in the conclusion in reference to the obvious phenomenon of China being split during the Cold War, of the engagements uh, by the PRC at the Bandung Conference and at the attempt to articulate more of a South-South cooperative framework at Bandung. And the idea, uh, especially during the Cold War, that these views and positions on international law that Chinese officials had taken over the years actually are really something that are more applicable at the global level. And they are actually shared, uh, in many cases, shared ideas and priorities and interpretations of legal concepts such as territorial sovereignty that uh, many other states, especially in the global south, have similar views about. So, we see at the Bandung Conference uh, in 1955 was the Asian African International Conference where Zhou Enlai um, uh, gives uh, one of the main addresses and is, is an active participant. This idea emerging of the uh, five principles of peaceful coexistence and of uh, all of these other sorts of policies that remain in effect today that kind of concretize some of these long-term projects of Chinese diplomats and officials. Um, and I basically try to argue that this is really part of a uh, story of continuity with at least what we saw in terms of the uh, agenda and goals of Chinese diplomats and officials since, again, around the 1907 Second Hague Conference. So, and even earlier in some sp in particular cases. So this set of uh, ag agendas that revolve around a certain approach to international law, more or less, uh, is, is a story of continuity over time. And um, I think that that is what sort of leaves the book with its kind of final takeaway, which is that some of the currently existing narratives surrounding China in the international legal system as a radically transformative force that's going to change everything which is, of course, uh, the way conversations on this topic uh, often exist in the US in particular uh, and uh, you know, in the publications of Western think tanks and places like that. Um, you know, I argue that those are really 
quite off base and that it's very important to have a more historically grounded view of such an important topic as China's role in the international legal order, right? I think you need to kind of have not necessarily all of the details of the history in mind, but at least the general historical narrative rather clear in order to be able to make an assessment of the current state of China's role in international law and the international legal institutions, as well as anything like an accurate prediction about you know, the future direction that that participation might take. So uh, I'll conclude the talk there and uh, really looking forward to people's questions. Thanks. So thank you very much, Ryan, for the presentation. And we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. 